tell you what you want to hear but what is good for you say lord open my heart that i'll stop looking for what i want to hear but what is good for me lord open my heart reorient reorient my position fix my gaze away from what my flesh desires but what is good for me lord i want to hear what you have to say to me help me to follow you this morning i want to hear what you have to say to me not what i want to hear Lord, fix me. Direct my heart. Fix me. Direct my heart. Direct my heart. That I will learn what is true. That I will hear what is true. Open my heart. Flood my heart with light. That I will know the hope of my calling. The essence of my salvation. The essence of my faith. What is the beauty and the riches and all the glory that accrues in this redemption that we have. That by reason of knowing you, that I might see the real beauty of Christianity. That I may receive the, that I may understand the real beauty of Christianity. Lord, help me. Lord, help me. In the name of Jesus. Father, we give you thanks. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Father, Lord, we ask that you bless this meeting. Bless our gathering this morning with your presence. With your manifest presence. Lord, we are hopeful. We are full of hope. We are full of expectation that your power can move amongst us. Lord, let your power move amongst us. Touch every heart. Open every eyes. Lord, grant grace and utterance to speak as an oracle that I may say what is true in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Praise the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. It's good to see everybody this morning. How are you all doing? I hope you had a good week. Hallelujah. Praise God. I know I look like a guru. But man proposes and God disposes. And man proposed to always dress like a pastor. But God disposed that there will be no light in our area. And you must wear what is available. Praise God. That was just a joke. We, um, hallelujah. I have like 10 yoga jokes in my head. But we're in a Christian church, so let me not um, let me believe myself. After service, I'll crack all the jokes. Hallelujah. Praise God. I want to start a new series this morning, um, The Lonely Walk of Faith. Interestingly, I was having a conversation with one of our sisters yesterday, and it was in the conversation that I had inspiration for it. I so already had a direction of what I believe the Lord put in my heart to, be, to teach in this series. And then that inspiration just came that we should call it The Lonely Walk of Faith. Hallelujah. So, um, like you know, like many of you know, one of the things that um, I think is very important that I believe I'm convinced in my heart by the inward, the inward witness of God in my heart is that one of the things that we are reshaping for Christians and the body of Christ now is also what the understanding of Christian faith is, what faith is, what faith actually is. Um, you know, in the past, I've done a couple of teachings and a couple of series on it. And those who have been here in the last one year, one and a half years, um, would already have heard it in different ways and all that. And it's something that will keep teaching. And every time we teach it, we'll teach it with more clarity. we we'll teach it with more light. and we we'll teach it with more vigor. And as more people are being added, nobody will be left behind. Hallelujah. One of the things I desire very, very much is that it will not be a church where people will say 20 years from now that, ah, when we started, this is where we were. Now we're not like that again. Hallelujah. So a lot of things that you keep hearing and hearing and hearing. And, and you know, the, the topic of faith is something that has to be, that's, you know, we have to keep saying. It has to be said over and over and over. Hallelujah. So basically, this is a, this is a teaching of faith. Isaiah chapter 51. Isaiah chapter 51. It's a teaching on Christian faith. Isaiah chapter 51. 
So God's prophet was speaking and he says, listen to me, you who pursue righteousness and who seek the Lord. Is there anybody here that pursues righteousness? Anybody here? Okay. And who seek the Lord? Is there anybody who seeks the Lord here? Okay. Look to the rock from which you were caught and to the quarry from which you were hewn. Look to the rock from which you were caught and to the quarry from which you were hewn. That means all of us here, children of God who seek after righteousness, who seek the Lord, there is somebody or there is something that is our template. Isaiah is telling us to look at it, right? He's telling those who pursue righteousness to look at that person or to look at that thing as a template. Verse 2 now tells us what that template is. He says, look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who gave you birth. When I called him, he was only one man, and I blessed him and made him many. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who gave birth to you. Abraham is our father, right? That's how I know that when Isaiah is speaking here, it applies to us. Because he's saying that you should look to Abraham, your father. Not only are we people those that pursue after righteousness and seek the Lord, Abraham is also our father, as the apostles tell us, and we're going to look at it now. You know, before we're going to go into it, um, Abraham is our father. Abraham is our template. The Lord chose Abraham in the scriptures as one person that he would use to demonstrate what faith really looks like. God positioned his life and his course, the course of his life, to be in such a way that he would use him to show us what faith looks like before what we call the law, the law of Moses comes and after it comes. Abraham is the one entity, apart from the Lord Jesus, obviously, that straddled those covenants in a sense that he was the one that, under, he, was, he was a man of faith before the law of circumcision was given and he was a man of faith even after the law of circumcision was given. In a way, the law of circumcision was actually the beginning of the, I don't know the word to use now, you know, um, um, you know, it's the beginning of the foundations of the law of Moses. Hallelujah. The law of circumcision when it came to Abraham was the beginning of the foundations of the law of Moses. You understand now, Romans chapter 4. So Abraham is our father. The Bible, God tells us through the prophets that we should look to Abraham. And that's why in this series, what we're going to do is that we're going to take our time slowly and we're going to move through Abraham's life and we're going to see all the things that we can learn about faith and how we can conduct ourselves in faith. Hallelujah. Praise God. Church, all together. We are going to look through the story of Abraham, and we're going to see all the things that God tells us through Isaiah that we should look for um, from Abraham, because Abraham is the rock from which we are hewn. Any man who is a man of faith is a kind of copy of Abraham in a sense. That's why I said, look to the rock that you were hewn. If you, if you take a rock, if you, if you hew a rock out of a bigger rock, that rock is only a, like a smaller portion of the bigger rock. Do you understand that? Telling us something, trying to put, paint a picture in our minds that every man or every man's faith is going to be... Abraham's faith work is the archetype for our faith. Everybody's faith work is going to be some kind of um, manifestation of Abraham's kind of faith. Everybody that's going to walk in faith, your faith work is going to be some kind of reiteration. It's going to be another kind of reiteration of what Abraham's kind of faith work was. That if you are going to be someone called righteous, if God is going to impute righteousness onto you because of the faith, you are going to just be doing what Abraham already did when righteousness was imputed to him by reason of his faith. Church all together. Mm. Romans chapter 4 from verse 1 says, what then, shall, what then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. Now, there's something that is good for me to explain here. When the Bible says that Abraham was justified, if, in fact, if Abraham was justified by work, then he has something to boast about, but not before God. Let me go on. Let's go. Let's go on. Verse 3. What does Scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, to the one who works... Wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. That means if a person works for something and you give the person the reward of what the person did, you are not giving the person a gift. What you are giving the person is a wage. Do you understand that? If you give a person righteousness 
after the person has done certain works, right? What we are giving the person is not the gift of righteousness. What we are giving the person is the reward, is the salary, is the wage of righteousness. And every salary or every age wage is earned. Every wage is earned. Your ogre is not give, doing you a favor when he pays you a salary at the end of the month. Do you understand that? Your boss is not doing you a favor. I know that in Nigeria, we have those kind of very bad behaviors and we act like, you know, we have a lot of evil cultures here that are very, very terrible. One of them is you employ people and they work for you and you pay them and you pay them as if you are doing them a favor. And them two are telling you thank you. Well, there's a place for gratitude, telling people that paid you thank you. It's fine. It's understandable that it's coming from the right heart. But the person that is, being, that is paying the people must not get it twisted. You are not doing them a favor. You are paying them a wage. You owe them. They gave you something and you must give them something back in return. If you are not giving them what, they owe, what, them, what you owe them back in return, you are stealing from them. They have given you something and you are not paying them back what is due. You are stealing from them. You are not doing them a favor. That's the reason why every employer, and these are part of the reason, these are the little, little things in different cultures that make some civilizations to be better for the people than others. In other countries, a plumber comes to work. In certain countries that are, you know, that countries, the kind of countries that people are running to, right? Look at the, these are the differences that you will see. If someone works for you in those countries, the person is not, you are not doing the person a favor. A plumber comes to fix something in your house. You don't do like as if you are doing him a favor. You pay, you pay him his money. Do you understand that? I don't have to be your friend. I don't have to smile with you. You pay me up because we is a transaction. Right? Praise God. Please, guys, listen. Yeah? These are part of the works of... These are part of following after Abraham. You understand? Mm. As many of you that God is going to give five talents. As many of you that God will give two talents. As many of you are going to be... As many of you are going to be employers of labor. I beg you in the name of God. Go and read the book of James chapter 5 and see the kind of curses on the head of employers that take advantage of their employees. A Christian who takes advantage of his employees is not a Christian. James makes it very clear. James makes it very clear. If you're going to be an employer, you are not doing your people a favor by paying them. It is their rights. If you don't pay them or you pay them wrongly or at the wrong time or you don't pay them what is their fair value for the service that they have rendered, you are doing evil. You are stealing from those people and God will punish you. I know it sounds like a joke, but it's true. The Bible says that anybody that has the capacity to do good and does not do it when he can, that person is committing a sin. You have the money, you have agreed with God, your people that are living, they have their families and people that are depending on them and you have agreed at the end of the month at such a time, you are supposed to pay them and then you now pay them at your convenience. You take a few days off because you are busy with something in your personal life and you don't pay people, people that their families are depending on the just wage, what they've earned and then you pay them when you like. You are committing sin. You are doing evil. And the just judge of all the earth will not allow anything go like that. Church all together. This example I've also given will help you to understand that. See, if a person fulfills righteousness by the law, the person is not, you are not God is not doing the person a favor by calling the person righteous. You understand that? If God is going to be just, God does not have a choice but to call the person what? righteous. If a person fulfills all the demands of the law, everything that is required to be righteous, if the person does it, if God does not call the person righteous, God is being what? Unjust. <laughs> Church, all together. Mm. Verse 4 now says, now to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, but trust God who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as what? Righteousness. And so that's the point. I need to make a point. Make a certain, I need to make a point here. When we say that the one who trusts in God and not in, in his works, God will call the person righteous. You need to understand something. 
When you are reading the Bible, don't assume that one word means everything everywhere that it is. In this context, in Romans chapter 3 and chapter 4 context, works here is referring to the works of the law of Moses. Hallelujah. Church, are we together? Church, are we together? If you scroll up to or read, go to chapter 3 from verse 27, you see what verse 27 says. Chapter 3, verse 27 says, it says, Where then is boasting? It is excluded because of what law? The law that requires law works? No, but because of the law that requires faith. So there are two laws being spoken of in Romans. There is a law that requires faith, and there is a law that requires works. The, the law that requires works is the law of Moses. But there's also something that Paul calls in Romans chapter 8, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus that has made you free from the law of sin and death. So there are two laws at work. Jesus has freed us from the requirements of the law of Moses so that we can now live our lives under the law of the, right, of the, law of the spirit of Christ. So we are also free from the works of the law of Moses to now live in the works of faith. Hmm. Do you understand what I just said now? Uh -huh. You see, there's this legover that these antinomians use. Where they will say, you have been freed from all works. You have not been freed from all works. You have been freed from the works of the law of Moses. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? You are not under the law of Moses. You are under the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. You are under the law of faith. Do you see it here? Let me read it again. Verse 23, chapter 3, verse 27. Where then is boasting? It is excluded because of what law? It is excluded because of what law? The law that requires works? No! Because, no, because of the law that requires what? Faith. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Verse 1 says, Therefore, there is now, there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. So there's a law of the Spirit that gives life, and there's a law of sin and what? Death. The law of Moses is the law of sin and death. The law of faith, the law of righteousness, the law of the spirit is the, the law of faith. Church, all together. So Christians, and the, what it means to be an antinomanian, or what people call hyper, it has different words in different dispensations. There was a time when they were Gnostics, some time when they were Docetists, sometimes in some places in the world today, they call it progressive Christianity. In some quarters of Nigeria and uh, Singapore, they call it hypergrace. And the Americans, they call it hypergrace, they call it different things. Basically, it is the idea that Christians are not under any law. It is a lie. Christians are under a law. It is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. So that is the reason why when you look through the scriptures, you will see certain things that the apostles articulate that are the lifestyles of Christians by which we may know that the person is a what? Christian. Christians are not lawless. Christians are not lawless people. We are not saved into lawlessness. That's why Jesus did not say, follow me and you don't have any body. He said, leave your body and follow my own. My own is light. <laughs> are you me now? <laughs> did you hear what I just said now? You are not saved into lawlessness. You are not saved into a life without a body. You are saved into a new law. You are saved from a law that kills you to a law that gives you life. So every spirit of aversion to being told what to do in Christianity, every spirit of aversion to being told that this is what is commanded that we ought to do, and then you begin to create middle grounds and middle categories and begin to try to explain why Christians are not under a law, that is the spirit of antinomianism. And it doesn't end well. It always leads to all kinds of lasciviousness and the works of Satan. Church, do you understand that? Mm. Praise God. So, are you following what I'm saying to you? So, when, um, if we go back to verse 4, Romans chapter 4, verse 4. No, let's go to Romans chapter 4, verse 5. Time is of the essence. Let's move. Romans chapter 4, verse 5 now says, However, to the one who does not walk, but trusts God, who justifies the ungodly, 
Their faith is credited as what? Righteousness. So the work he's talking about here is the work of the law of Moses. David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of whom God credits righteousness apart from works. The works here is not the works of faith that James was talking about. He was talking about the works of the law. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against them. Is this blessedness only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? We have been saying that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. Under what circumstances was it credited? Was it after he was circumcised or before? It was not after, but before. So, Apostle Paul is using the life of Abraham, just like I want to take time to also do, looking at what the apostles say, and breaking it down for you to also see what the apostles say about Abraham, and look at Abraham's life, and you will learn it practically, what is being said here. So, one of the things that Abraham, Paul is teaching us here, we're not going to focus on this particular lesson here, we're coming back to it. But, you know, one of the things we need to say here is that, see, um, Abraham was called righteous even before the circumcision was given. And I was like I was saying earlier, circumcision was the foundation of the law of Moses. It was the first time that people were being, give, being given a law to identify as being part of God's people. Anyway, we'll come to that. But Abraham was called righteousness, righteous before he even began to obey the command to circumcise. So that means there is a way a man can be called righteous by God even without following the law of Moses. That's Paul's point here. That even before a law is given, which is the law of Moses, even before the law of Moses, it is possible that theoretically a Gentile, because the moment, in the, the point where people stopped being Gentiles to become Hebrews was the point of circumcision. Where circumcision started. Do you understand what I just said now? I might speak over your heads. The point where Abraham moved from being called a Gentile, like all of us, to being called where they now became the people of God, where they became God's people, the Hebrews, officially was at the point where the law of circumcision began. That's why Jewish people know they are God's people by what? Circumcision. And if you want to become part of them, the most important is for you to become what? Circumcised. And that's why Paul draws that parallel in, in the New Testament, the book of Colossians, to say when a child of God, when a Christian is becoming, the, the parallel for circumcision for Christian is what? Baptism. Do you understand what I'm saying now? <laughs> so that he drew that parallel in Colossians chapter 2. That see, the point where a man becomes God's people was the point of circumcision. So, but guess what? God called Abraham righteous even before that point. So letting you know that a man can be righteous outside of the law of Moses. That's what Paul is trying to drive out here. He now says, verse 11 now says, and he received circumcision as a sign, a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So an uncircumcised person can be called righteous by faith. Hallelujah. So then, he is the father of all who believe but have not been circumcised in order that righteousness might be credited, credited to them. So that is why he is our father. I know that we as you know, generally the world has moved away from people being uncircumcised to circumcised. So most of us here now are circumcised people, right? I mean physically circumcised, like Jewish people, right? I know that. But in the original context of the world, we are the ones they call uncircumcised because we are Gentiles. Do you understand that? <laughs> so Paul is telling us something here that Abraham, so then he is the father of all who believe but have not been circumcised in order that righteousness might be credited to them. So we the Gentiles, you are all Gentiles. You understand that? Even Igbo people, all of you here, you are all what? Gentiles. It's true. And because I know some of our people say that they are the lost tribe. You are not the lost tribe of anything. You are a Gentile with all of us. Have you heard what I said? <laughs> like you see me, be buying chauffeur and be carrying horn up and down and be covering your head, be deceiving yourself. Hallelujah. Church, are we together? So, even though physically we might have been circumcised in quotes, he's talking about we're uncircumcised. So, we, righteousness is credited to us even though we are uncircumcised. Why? Because we believe like Abraham. Hallelujah. Because we believe like Abraham. Verse 12 now says, and he is then also the father of the circumcised who not only are circumcised, but who also follow in the footsteps of faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. So, even the Jewish people that were circumcised, he is also their father 
if they believe just like he believed. Do you understand that? So Abraham was a good picture of someone that can have righteousness before being circumcised and have righteousness after being circumcised. So that both those who are circumcised and those who are not uncircumcised, he is the father of both of them. But as long as they believe, are just like he did what? Believed. Are you with me now? See, Paul sabi this work. Do you understand that? That's what he will say. So any Jewish person today that believes in God the way Abraham did, Abraham is his father. In fact, we go to the book of Galatians and other places, he explains that what even makes him your father is not even the fact that just because you're circumcised and biologically, you have the same DNA. What makes him your father is that you believe just like him. Hallelujah. Verse 13 now says, It was not through the law that, and the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be the heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who depend on the law are heirs, faith means nothing, and the promise is what? Worthless. Because the law brings wrath, and where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, the promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all if Abraham's offspring. Who are Abraham's offspring? Look at it now. Now it says, not only those who are of the law, but also to those who have the faith of what? Abraham. Hallelujah. Praise God. Say, I'm Abraham's offspring. Look at the way it ends. It says, he is the father of us all. He is the father of us all. I mean, why Abraham's children here? Praise God. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. So when that promise came, he was not saying that I'm promising Abraham that through you, many multinationals will come out of you. This is what it means when he says I've made you a father of many nations. It means Nigerians, Togolese, South Africans, Gambians, Egyptians, Australians, all of us can believe like Abraham and he will be our father. That's what made him the father of many nations. Hallelujah. So that promise is not for you to appropriate and say, there's a blessing on my life like Abraham to create a multinational in many countries. That's not what the Bible says. Hallelujah. He's, he's our father in the sight of God in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. Hallelujah. So let's go back to Isaiah 51. So that's how I know. Because you have to be very careful when you're teaching, when you're reading the Bible not to look for yourself in the Bible. What the Bible is talking about is what it's talking about. So, now we know, based on what the apostles have taught, that when Isaiah says to, to, to when Isaiah says, look to Abraham your father, and to Sarah who gave you birth, he's talking to us. Are we together now? So that's why we can now go to Abraham's story to learn lessons from it. Gen Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. Please, I just want to reiterate again. We are not saved into lawlessness. Amen? We are not saved into lawlessness. Amen? We are not saved into a faith that has no burdens. We are not saved into lawlessness. It is lawlessness to do evil and not want to confess it in, in prayer. It is lawlessness. That's the spirit of lawlessness. It's a spirit of wantonness. It's a spirit of anyhowness. It's a spirit of Satan. You do evil. You transgress against your father and your God. And you are talking to him. See, nothing, nothing did happen. And then make sure I say that, that counts balance. It's a spirit. You are not a child. Just second one, to me. That's why John ended the next verse, chapter 2, and says, I'm writing to you, my who? Children. God's children know. God's children confess their sins. It's those that know as children that don't confess their sins. You know what I just said now? If you've noticed that when you are committing sin, you just, I did something bad now. You did something bad. You did evil. You are going before God. You don't think it is right for you to say, Lord, this thing I've done is wrong. Cleanse me. Help me that I may grow. You don't think it's appropriate. Hallelujah. It's only God's children that do it. Those that don't do it, it's because they're not God's children. That's just the truth. Hallelujah. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. The Lord, the Lord had said to Abraham, go from your country, 
Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. This blessing was to Abraham, not to you. This blessing was to Abraham. He say you, Abraham, not you here. Don't write checks for yourself that God did not promise to sign. Just be writing blank check and be going to the bank and they're embarrassing you in the bank. You now say God is not faithful. God did not promise you here that I will make you a, nas- a household name all over the nations of the earth because he was speaking to Abraham. You can't appropriate this because it's not you. Church, you understand what I'm saying to you? You will see the one that pertains to you. Okay? Verse 4 now says, So Abraham went as the Lord had told him. This is the definition of faith. Abraham went as the Lord had told him. This is the definition of faith. Faith is not the ability to dream big. Faith is not the ability or the strong will to imagine big and great things. Faith is not the ability to desire certain materially or earthly considered mighty things and believe that you will achieve them. That is not what Abraham's faith is. The faith that we are hewn out of, the faith that we are imitating, the faith that God calls righteous, the faith that makes Abraham our father, the faith that we must abide by if we are going to be Christians, is this faith. Abraham went as the Lord had told him. Faith is simply to believe and follow God's word. When God says, do this, and you do it, that is faith. The only time when faith overlaps with seeing big things is if it is God that said, do that big thing, in quotes. Do you understand what I said now? That's the only time. Did you hear what I just said now? That is the only time. Faith, primarily, faith, fundamentally, is hearing God's word and obeying it. Faith is not about dreaming big. Faith is not about doing what you want. Faith is not about having a big vision, having a faith project. Faith is about Going when God says go. Stopping when God says stop. When God says do this and you do it, you're a man of faith. So a man of faith is a man that is obedient to God. That's all. Church, are we together now? That's what faith is about. That's what faith is about. That's why you begin to see that through the Bible, people of faith had different kinds of material outcomes. Because God in his sovereignty and God in his omniscience and God in his endless creativity, he can look at the tapestry of the entire creation. He can look at all the inner workings of the entire creation. He has a big picture view of reality that no other entity has. He's the one that can see things from a perspective that no other person can see. So when God is telling you to do something or carry it out, there are many times when it will look like as if it makes sense. And there are times when it cannot make sense to you because you don't have God's perspective. Church, I was together. So faith is about following what God has said. To put this in perspective. I know, and this is something I'm going to take time for you to unlearn because it took me time to unlearn it too. And you're going to go through your own cycle of... um, Conflict and crisis internally, especially if you have been steeped in a culture or in a teaching or a doctrine where you think that faith is about getting big, big stuff. 
It will take you some time, but you will balance out. Don't worry. Okay? Uh-huh. But it happens to many people. Yeah, many people. When we started, we say this is what faith is. Yeah. So does that mean God does not? So does that mean God does not? <laughs> you, your body will settle down. Okay? So put it in perspective for you. When people are looking through the Bible and see examples of faith, people that did big things, that they believe God and God can use you like a big person, the people that they mention are not many. After they mention Moses, they will mention Abraham because Abraham was rich. They mention David, Solomon, Esther, Daniel. What are the other ones? Joseph, how many other? Which? Jabez. You understand? They mention six, seven, let's say Max, ten people that had material riches. Those are the examples that we always use. But if we want to be people of sound mind and want to use the, the, the faculties that God gives us, how many characters are in the Bible? How many characters were listed in the Bible? Even if it is only 1,000. 10 over 1,000 is what? 10 divided by 1,000 is what? Aha. You understand what we're saying now? You understand what I'm saying now? It's not everybody that will be Abraham in terms of material distance. Not everybody will be Solomon. Sometimes Isaiah. Sometimes Jeremiah. You understand, you understand what I'm saying now? It's not every time. Sometimes Jonah. You understand what I'm saying here? Sometimes Nathan. It's not everybody that will be David. Isn't everybody that will be Solomon? So, will you say that all those people that did not have some kind of big riches, that they did not work in faith, can you say that? Were all those people not considered people of faith? Have you read Hebrews chapter 11 before? So, all those people that did all those things that did not have any obvious material positive comfort, in quotes, if they were working by faith, let it settle into your mind now. That what it means to walk in faith is not to be materially comfortable. What it means to walk in faith is not even to suffer. Do you understand that? Because you know you can say it and not say it the other way. eh? What it means to walk in faith is not to be a rich man or to walk in material comfort. Neither does it mean that walking in faith means that you are suffering. Walking in faith simply means obeying what God's word says. And so that means that in his wisdom, if at a certain time the command leads to material comfort, we lift up our hands and give God things that count what's worthy to have, enjoy some comfort. But if that command also leads to suffering, what do you do? You lift up your hands and give God thanks for the privilege to be obedient. So these rubbish things we're doing now, where you want God to be telling you thank you for serving him. You serve God, then you go and use it to harass him and say, God, I just did something for you. Remember me. Remember me. Remember me. Lord, because I have served you, this contract must pass through. <laughs> Bro, let me tell you what happened. Let me tell you what Jesus said. Go and check it. Luke chapter 17. He says that when your master sends you, what you come and tell your master is, we are not worthy. You don't, your master does not say thank you. Luke chapter 17. Let me say it the way Jesus said it. It won't be sweet in my mouth. I believe it's Luke chapter 17, right? Hallelujah. Look at verse 7. Suppose one of you has a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down to eat? Won't he rather say, Prepare my supper, get yourself ready, and wait on me while I eat and drink. And after that, you may eat. He said, you normal people, if you pray someone to walk, and the servant is on the field, the person has walked since morning, you will now come back home to eat. Will you say, ah, I'm hungry, but you know what? You go and rest. I won't eat. I will, wait. I will be hungry till you have rested. After you have rested and you are satisfied, you can come and feed me tomorrow morning. Do you say that? Jesus said, what do you tell the person? He says, you tell the person, go and walk and get me my food. After I finish eating, then you can now go and rest. Look at it. Now says, verse 9. Will he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? Will you thank the servant for doing his job that you employed him for? Verse 10 now says, so you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, 
We are unworthy servants. We have only done our words. See, there are problems. A lot of things that we were taught was faith are the opposite of it. This idea that God has been serving you, I've been in church, I've been in sanctuary keepers, I'm in the choir. Lord, I'm having a tough time. Come through for me. Lord, come through for me. Remember my sacrifice. Jesus said, what's wrong with you? After serving God, after you have broken your head for the gospel from beginning to night, you should say, God, I'm an unworthy servant. I've, done what, I've just done my duty. The sense of entitlement to God must give me what I want because I served him. It's a totally mis... It's, it, you know what? It just boils down to your understanding and doctrine of God because God is small in your eyes. Because God is small in your eyes. How many of you in your place of work, your CEO, that big man, that ogre, that ogre, pata pata, he tells you to go and do something for him. And after you have done it, you go and tell him that, sir, how far? I just, I just want to buy food for you. Do something. All of you. When he's even telling you, thank you, come and you say, no, sir, I'm not worried, no. <laughs> you say, no, ah, no, sir. You, because you know that it is more important for you to serve someone of that caliber. Because serving him alone is a privilege. You know. When it comes to God, you say, Lord, remember. Except you are not God. God will forgive us. Faith is to do what God has asked you to do. Faith is to do what God has asked you to do. And that is one of the reasons why this distortion, this distortion and twisting of what faith is has had a lot of consequences. It has had so many consequences that because we don't even understand what faith is anymore, we have completely destroyed what faith is about. We look back at Abraham and superimpose our redefinition of faith on him. And based on our redefinition of faith, Abraham falls from that standard. And because he has fallen from that standard, we will be preaching Abraham as someone that staggered in faith. When what the apostles teach us is that Abraham did not stagger in faith. That Abraham is the example of faith. That Abraham did not fall. How many times have you guys heard that Abraham, at the point he was faith was weak and he went into Sarah and he went into Hegai. That's the proof that his, his faith was weak. And because his faith was weak, that's why Ishmael came. And Ishmael persecuted Isaac. That's the proof that he, if God has given you a big vision and you lose faith and you cannot see the big vision and you look for a plan B, that plan B will come and persecute the original plan that God had for your life. How many times have you heard this? That thing is error. That thing is complete and total error. I will show you now. Do you know, do you see what happened now? That's why this matter of one minute past 12 is very important. You small deviation from the biblical definition of faith. You trace it down the line. Before you know it, you are rereading the entire Bible to the point where you are saying the opposite of what the apostle said. The Bible tells us that Abraham did not stagger in faith. You, you are saying Abraham staggered in faith. We will see who is right now. Genesis chapter 15. Abraham staggered in faith to only people that have redefined what faith is. Faith is to obey God. And you will see that not once did Abraham disobey. Not once did he stagger in faith. It's because you are an illiterate. You don't know how to read the Bible. You don't understand the Bible. Yes, I can say that because for you to insult our father of you, I would like to insult you back. <laughs> yes. If you have the audacity to say Abraham staggered in faith, Abraham, the place, the place that people are going to rest in his bosom after they die, it's not your fault. Genesis chapter 15, I'll show you. Verse 1. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abraham, I am your shield and your very great reward. And Abraham said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? You see prayer? This is a man of faith prayer. Don't worry, I'm coming back. We'll come back to it. Just let me quickly just talk about this. Do you see the way a man of faith prays? He says, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who inherit my, my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. A man looking to the hand of God, knowing that God is the one that can do this matter. 
not as one entitled, not as one misbehaving. This whole idea of we're now children of God and everything, we're taking it out of bounds. Have you read the way the apostles prayed in the New Testament? Go and read the, um, 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 Acts chapter 4. The same thing they said too. Sovereign Lord, you that created the heavens and the earth and all that is in it, move your hand. Verse 3 now says, and Abraham said, you have given me no children. Do you see what we're saying here? All this idea of if something is not going my way, it's not God that is, it's Satan that is doing it. He said, see, see, God, you can do all things. If I don't have children, of course you don't want it. Do you understand what I'm saying here? This is faith. That even with something is going in an uncomfortable way, if God has allowed it, it's because... I'm sorry. <laughs> if God has allowed it, it's because he knows what he is doing. Someone will read this and say, Abraham, do not have revelation knowledge. It's not your fault. Though. That's why you're not confessing your sins. It's not your fault. He says, you have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. So God told Abraham, your son will be your heir. God did not mention how the son was going to come. God did not mention anything. God being fully aware of the complete context of Abraham's life and all that was going inside of it said to him, it is your son that will be your heir. Then he took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars. If indeed you can count them, then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. You read it to the end of the chapter. That's all God said concerning the specifics of how Abraham would have a child. How Abraham would have an heir. God said, it is your son. Not Sarah's son. Not anybody's son. It is your son. Now go to chapter 16. Verse 16, chapter 16, verse 1. Now, Sarai, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children. And when she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar, so she said to Abraham, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Now, this is another part where I said there's a lot of illiteracy going on. In, ancient, in the ancient Near East, the way people have children is not only biologically. And this is nothing that people don't realize. Say, uh, go to seminar, you know. There's a call upon my life. Speak in tongues. Say, you have gone to start a study church. These are the problems. And I'm speaking as someone that also started church that same way. There are problems. In the ancient Near, Near East, people have children not only biologically. If you check Genesis chapter 30, you'll see something. Rachel, Jacob's second wife, could not have children. Because of that, she now told her husband, Jacob, to go into her, the, her, her handmaiden so that when she has that child, the child will become her own. So in those days, someone can actually give birth and the child will become your own. Do you understand that? That's why actually, these are some of the confusions that people have with Jesus' genealogy and all that. There were certain kings and in the line of David that some of the children were not biologically from that line, but the king adopted them as one of their children because of that they became part of that line. Do you understand what I'm saying to you now? This is the spirit by which in the New Testament you can be called the child of God by adoption. Do you understand what I'm saying? What Sarah was saying was not anything strange. She was saying, have a child through another woman, I will adopt the child, and the child will be like my child. From what God has spoken, is there anything wrong or contrary to it here? And Abraham agreed to what Sarai said. So after Abraham had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian slave, Hagar, and gave to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar, and she conceived. So the child that was coming from Hagar was actually supposed to be Sarah's son. That was the agreement. It was not a misunderstanding. It was not a staggering in faith. God said, you will have a son. You will have a son. God did not tell him how it will come and everything. And the man in his faithfulness did not even want to look for a child outside. His wife came and said, let us get a child. In your, today now, you may call it surrogacy. That's the kind of mentality that you have towards it now, that you might not have to carry someone in your pregnancy, in your tummy, but the child is still your child. In the same way, 
Another person could give birth in their culture and the child will be your child. This is the reason why God judged Onan. When he did coitus interruptus for his brother's wife. That's the scientific name for it. There's not that way that I would say that would not sound funny. All right, here. You understand what I'm saying here? When he spilled the seed. That is what happened. So, actually what actually happened there was that Onan had a brother, right? And, he, and the, the wife that, 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 that he had a brother that died and his wife was there, right? That brother has an inheritance. The father has shared an inheritance for all of them. If, that, if his son, if his brother does not have any son or any male heirs, all the son's property will revert to him. So what they do is that so that the lineage of that son will not die and that inheritance will be the son's inheritance, the brother can lay a seed in his brother's wife and that son will stand as his father. As, do you understand? The uncle's father, that will not be his son. So he will take that inheritance. Onan was trying to steal that inheritance. That's why he was doing what he was doing. So in a way, he wanted to kill his brother twice. We had to, the brother died biologically and wanted to kill his brother's legacy. You might not understand it, but that is the way it was. And so God judged him. Ah, Alatenuje. It's too much. You have an opportunity for your brother's name to, be, to remain in the earth, to produce a seed for him so that he can remain in the earth. You say, no, you are not doing all kinds of secret tricks. So that that inheritance can come to you, and God judged him. The people that wrote the Bible did not come from Washington State. Neither did they come from Kansas or New York. Church, you understand what I'm saying to you? So when Sarah made this statement, Ishmael was coming to be a son. And that is the reason why, after the fought and everything happened, and Hagar now changed her mind. <laughs> God is normal. Amen. Um, and Hagar changed her mind and she chased, sorry, and Sarai changed her mind and chased Hagar out of the house. And, and she was pregnant. Hagar was pregnant in the wilderness. Look at what happened. Verse 7. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was spring. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going to? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, Go back to your mistress and submit to her. Then the angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord said to her, You are now pregnant. You will give birth to a son. His name, you shall name him what? Ishmael. The Lord has heard your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hands against him. And he will live in hostility towards all his words, brothers. So you can see where everything started. God now says, I will increase your descendants so much that were so numerous to count. So Ishmael was the will of God. Ishmael was not a mistake. Ishmael was not a mistake. If God had told Abraham before then that Abraham, your son is going to come through Sarah alone, Abraham would have not gone to any other woman apart from Sarah. Do you understand what I'm saying? God said it is your son because God knew and he wanted it to be so. That's why if you go and read the book of Galatians chapter 4, Paul now explains to us that God in his wisdom intended that Ishmael standing at the seed of Hagar, which is the law of the Moses, was meant to come before the seed of promise, Isaac, who is supposed to be an example of grace by what? Faith. So do you understand what's happening here? It was God's eternal counsel and plan that Ishmael must come before Isaac. And just as Ishmael's hand was against the hand of his brothers, that when Isaac was born, he persecuted him, it was the will of God before time that the law of Moses will come before salvation by faith so that the law of Moses might persecute grace by faith. Abraham did not make a mistake. Abraham did not stagger in unbelief. Get rid of your faith definitions. And that's why it's so very, very important for you to understand something here. If at every point in time, you are doing your best and obeying the last command that you got from God's word, you will never go wrong. Did you hear I just said now? If at every point in time, you are obeying God's word, if at every point in time, 
God's word comes and you are living and obeying God's word. Even when it looks on the outside like as if things are going wrong, those things will always be oriented back to fulfill God's purpose for your life. You can never be wrong walking in faith. You can never fall walking in faith. You can never see shame if you are walking in faith. You can never be confounded if you are walking in faith. You can never make an error. You can never stumble. You can never dash your foot against a stone if you are walking in faith. That's why in Genesis chapter 16, Genesis chapter um, 17, Genesis chapter 17, verse 15, God now appeared to Abraham again. And after I gave him the covenant of circumcision, it now says in verse 15, God also said to Abraham, as for your wife, Sarai, your wife, as, as for Sarai, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be what? Sarah. I will bless her and I will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of people will come for her. Abraham fell down. He laughed and he said to himself, will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah be a child at age of 90? And Abraham said to God, if only Ishmael might live under your blessing. So Abraham did not think that he had, Abraham did not disobey. Abraham actually believed that Ishmael was the son that was the son of promise. He did not stagger. He just obeyed the last command. You will have a son. It was here that God now told him, verse 19. Then God said, yes, but your wife Sarah will bear a son and you will call him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an, as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. I will surely bless him. I will make him fruitful and I will greatly increase his numbers. He will be the father of 12 rulers and I will make him into a great nation. But my covenant, I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you by this time next year. When he had finished speaking with Abraham, he went up from him. So do you understand what happened here now? Do you see what happened? It was here after Ishmael had been born, that God now said the seed and the covenant will come through Sarah's seed. Abraham never staggered. Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. Verse 18. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations. Just as he had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old and that Sarah's womb was also what? Dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was what? Strengthened in his faith and did what? Gave glory to God. Be fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. Be fully persuaded. He was strengthened. He did not waver. It is not from your mouth that Paul will say something and you say Paul was wrong. It's not your mouth. It's not your mouth. Hallelujah. Without weakening in faith, Without weakening in faith. Without weakening in faith. Hallelujah. Praise God. Without weakening in faith. And so, what is the lesson here for us? Whenever God says something, obey. You will never go wrong. God is using your obedience for something. Whenever God has given you a word, obey. As much as you know, as much as the revelation that you have at every point in time, with the amount of facts that God has presented to you, with the amount of information that God has presented to you, obey. God is in control and God is using your obedience. This is what faith is. Church, I get what I'm saying to you. This is what faith is. This is what faith is. This is what faith is. When the Bible tells us, when the Bible teaches us that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, 
and we should keep it pure. Is a command. Sexual purity is more than an ethic for Christians. It's working in faith. It's working in faith. There are a lot of questions that people ask that it can be appropriate for unbelievers, but for you it is not appropriate. Someone will ask questions and say, how can I know that I'll be sexually compatible with the person I'm getting married with? If we don't have sex before marriage, if we don't test, how shall we know? But walking in faith is to obey the command. And what is the command? Keep yourself pure. Don't have sex with someone that you're not married to. Keep yourself pure. That is walking in faith. All these talks of sexual compatibility are appropriate for unbelievers. They are statements of faithlessness. Listen, and let me paint it very well for you. Faith is not, I believe very much that God, even though we don't have sex, God will make us sexually compatible. No. Do you, you see what just happened there now? Faith is not, I know that God will make it that we'll be sexually compatible. No. Faith is God has said, I will keep myself pure and I will what? Obey. Come what? Me. That's faith. Did you hear what I just said now? Did you hear what I just said now? That is what faith is. Faith is not, I will marry this guy because I can see the talent in him. And I know that God will one day make him a very rich and great man. That is not faith. Faith is, the life of a man is not in the abundance of the things that he possesses. This man does not have money, so I'm not rating him by the amount of money. I love him and I will marry him because he's a good man. Do you understand what just happened now? Faith is not God will make him blow one day. So I am marrying him to blow. You are not better than the person that is marrying someone that has blown now. Do you understand that? Do you understand what I just said now? Faith is not... I am marrying this man because I can see his prospects and I have faith that one day he will blow. No! Faith is that the life of a man is not in the abundance of the things that he possesses. So, we will not rate anybody by how much money they have. We will marry him. I will marry him. One person, right? <laughs> I will marry him because he's a child of God and he's a good man and we will build our house together, our life together. Whether he blows or not, I'm marrying him because I want to build a Christian family. If you are marrying him because you will blow, in your mind, this confession, I'm a woman of faith. You are not a woman of faith anything. You are a woman of smart materialism. Because you are, you are still materialistic. You are just a little bit smarter. Your own materialism knows how to delay gratification. Some people do not know how to delay gratification. But you are still what? Materialistic. These are one of the differences I noticed. You know, you say, you travel and see what people say. Those people that are different from us, we just like money too much and all that. that they, well, we're very materialistic. They, lie, they are very materialistic too. They like money. It's just that them, they know how to delay gratification. So I don't understand you. Faith is not, I know my God will heal me now. If God does, or except he's not in heaven. Faith is, I know my God is good and he will do what is well. I desire that I will be healed and he will be healed and I will be healed. But if I am not healed, God is still faithful. See what I just said now? That is what faith. This is faith. Faith is God has commanded something and I will obey it. It's very, very weird that people call themselves faith churches and they don't even do the things that God commanded. And you see a consistency with people's faith dying. It is better to obey what God has said even though you don't have a good theology of it, you cannot systematize it and you don't understand it. Your own is that you shall believe in God said it, I'm doing it. You are better than those that can systematize and do a lot of theology and theologize their way into hellfire. 
you see some very, very interesting things and some very, very interesting studies that will show that certain countries that seem to be orthodox are retaining their faith. And those that are because we Protestants, we, we deal with our theology. Theology, they hook us. It's where the churches that claim that they are churches of faith, God said, go ye into the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son of the Holy Spirit. Peter will say, what Ben may ask Peter, what shall we do to be saved? He will say, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. God commanded it, but you are a nation of, you are a church of faith, but you don't obey God when he says, baptize my people. Jesus says, take my body and take my blood. In remembrance of me, he commanded it. You are a man of faith, but you don't obey the sacraments. You are not a man of faith. Faith is obeying God. Faith is not, receive it, receive it, receive it here, receive it here. That's not faith. Anybody can do that. That's why someone can come to a pulpit and be preaching blatant heresy and be lying against the Bible. He's saying the Bible, adultery is only for women. I'm saying kinds of foolish things. And people will be rolling tongues on top. And after that, they can still move full moves and people will still fall under the anointing. Faith is believing and obeying God. That is all. When God has said something, you do it. Faith is do not neglect the gathering of the saints. Faith is the church on Sunday, even when it's inconvenient for me, I will obey God's word and I will not neglect the gathering of the feeling. That is faith. You think faith is until the time is coming when they want to sack everybody in the company. You now go and table your prayer request before God and you're now praying and saying, God, I will be an exception. Even when there's light, there's darkness in Egypt, there will be light upon me and you think that that is faith. That's not what faith is. Faith is every Sunday, every Wednesday, every prayer meeting. When God's children are being gathered together to worship God, you know that you ought to be there and you obey God's command and you go there. That's what faith is. Listen to me. The reason why you are collapsing in the day of adversity is because you never really had faith. The reason why someone dies in the family, and this is not to diminish anybody's suffering. You understand what I'm saying? This is not to diminish anybody. The reason why one kind of suffering will come, one time of poverty will come, one kind of brokenness or someone's family is sick, and then your faith collapses, and next thing you are saying, you don't believe in God anymore, is because, see, if you collapse in the day of, of, of adversity, it means your what? Strength was little. You never had strength. The strength of faith, a man that is a man of faith, is not in the day when problem comes that you start exercising that faith, that God will deliver me. Faith starts from obeying God on every little thing that he commands. You know they come church. You they come when they they convenient for you. You don't form... Uh, uh, did I just turn to pigeon? You are forming, I can come to church when I like. You don't obey the simple instructions, the clear instructions. It's when you now fall sick that you think your heart can cleave to God until you see your healing. It's a lie. It's a lie. Should I get what I'm saying to you? Faith is husbands sin for your wives. Faith is husbands love your wives and give yourselves for them. Husbands sin for your wife. Let Petrarchy FC say whatever they want to say. The man is a simp, kinikor, kinikor. his wife is controlling him. That's your problem. Husbands love your wives. That is faith. Faith is putting yourself and be vulnerable so that even if you take advantage of it, let it be so. Love your wives. Faith is not um, Andrew Tate. You understand that? Faith is wife. Submit to your what? Husband. Faith is not a strong independent woman. Nobody can tell me what to do. You know what I'm saying to you? Faith is obeying God's word. And that's why it's actually a very lonely walk. Faith is obedience. Faith is obeying God's word. Faith is employees be faithful to your employer. Even when they are maltreating you. As long as they are there, never do anything wrong or against that institution that you are serving. That is faith. Faith is obeying God. Faith is obeying God. If you are not obeying God every day, when the day of adversity comes, you will not be able to stand. Faith is obeying God. Let's bow down our heads. We'll continue next Sunday. Bow down our heads and let's pray. 
Let's pray. Let's pray. Hey. I want us to spend a few minutes first praying. I want to pray a prayer of faith, a prayer of sanctification, a prayer of stating to God that I am I'm committed to obeying your commands. I'm committed to obeying your commands. I'm, I'm going to obey your commands, even when it doesn't make sense. Even when it doesn't feel like it. Even when it's not convenient. I will obey. I will never lose trust in you. Even the times when things are not comfortable, I will not lose trust in you. And even when things are too comfortable, I will not forget you. I will hold on to you. In the good times and in the bad, I will not forget you. In comfort and in pain, I will not forget you. In pleasure and in suffering, I will not forget you. Even when you put things in my heart and you put visions in my heart, I will believe in your ability to bring it forth. I will not, I will not falter. I will not fail. I will not falter. I will not fail. I will believe in you. Even when the world wants me to compromise and it will make me lose certain things, I will hold on to you, the rock of my salvation. I will stay on the cross and I will do that which you command even when it will cost me even when I'm being threatened even when the nations are raging against me even when the people around me are raging against me even when I can see some kind of harm coming in the way I will stay the course and I will obey your word I will obey your word because I know that you're working all things that according to the counsel of his will you make all things to work together for good for them who are your beloved I know that all things will work together for my good I will stay the course I will stay in faith. I will keep obeying your word even until the end. Even until the end. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Father, I will give you praise. Father, I will give you praise. I have a prayer in my heart. I have a prayer in my heart. It's a twofold prayer. The first prayer is that anybody here who is not accustomed to hearing the inward witness of God's, of God's direction. Anybody who is not accustomed, who by reason of disuse or lack of practice, you don't, you don't know what it means when God gives you an impression that this is what I'm meant to do. Between what is right and what is good. You are, you know, you've not, you are not accustomed to God speaking to your heart. And giving you an inward witness that this is the right thing to do. I pray for you this morning by the grace of God. That God will awaken that faculty inside of you. That God will awaken that faculty inside of you. That when God is speaking to you about things that pertain to you, you will hear. In the name of Jesus. If there's anybody that's been stuck in limbo for a long time. You have been stuck in limbo. You are not making progress in your own life as God will have you do because you are not doing the things that God will have you do. And it's simply because you have not learned to, to know what is the right thing to do at every point in time. I pray for you this morning in the name of Jesus by the grace of our Lord that the Lord will awaken that faculty inside of you. That the Lord will awaken that faculty inside of your heart. That when he speaks, you will know. When is the time for you to do the right thing? Between the right thing and the good thing, you will do the right thing. When it is time for you to make a step that you ought to make, you will make that step in the name of Jesus. I pray for you that at every point in time, when you get to a T-junction, you will hear a voice in your heart. You will get that impression in your heart telling you that this is the way to go. This is the way to go in the name of Jesus. And I pray for you, everyone who does not know God's word, Anybody who has not been used to God's word and that does not know what is God's word for our daily living and because of that have been living like those of the world you've not been obeying it. I pray for you that beginning today it marks a new dispensation in your life where you will be given to God's word to read it and study it to be full of it and to obey it in the name of Jesus. Beginning from today your personal devotion will change beginning from today, I pray for you by the power of our Lord that your personal devotion will change. You will begin to know God's word. You will begin to understand God's word and you will begin to obey it every day. You begin to obey it every day. God's word will direct everything you do. You will be full of God's word in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Father, we give you thanks. 
Father, we give you thanks. Let's give God thanks because he hears us. He hears us. Let's give God thanks. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus.